Good afternoon and welcome to today's Downing Street press conference. I'm pleased to be joined here today by Dr Jenny Harris from the Chief Executive of the UK, UK Health Security Agency and Paul Lincoln who's the Director General of Border Force. We've made enormous progress this year tackling the pandemic across Britain. We're not at the end of it, but the signs are very hopeful. That progress has been hard won, won by the speed and success of our NHS vaccination programme, by the huge scale of our testing, and by the sheer sacrifice and the discipline of the British public. And so it's important that we don't put that success and undermine it now by putting it at risk. Getting a vaccination feels like being given your life back, newly vaccinated, thanking the wonderful volunteers, people in tears of relief. But as well as the joy, there's also concern about resurgence of COVID, and it's a caution we absolutely share as a government. And it's why the only route out of this pandemic is careful and prudent, a responsible one. Of course, we're also, uh, as a nation, uh, a group of people who thrive on travel, a nation with family ties across the globe. Notably, nearly one in three new mothers in the UK was born overseas. And in 2019, UK residents took over 93 million trips abroad. So I'm glad to be standing here today announcing the first, albeit tentative, steps towards unlocking international travel. We want a summer in which, with the help of vaccines and testings, we can reunite family and friends, travel to places we love. We want to start looking outward again. Whilst COVID has isolated us, travel reunites us. Even if video calls have kept us all connected during the very long lockdowns, there's simply no substitute for human contact. Travel is, of course, also absolutely crucial to rebuilding our economy, bringing long-awaited relief to hard-hit airlines, airports, the tourism sector, which taxpayers have spent £7 billion in supporting. But I have to be absolutely straight with you. Our success in combating COVID here, with two-thirds of adults now vaccinated, is not yet replicated in many places abroad. We in this country have managed to construct a fortress against COVID, but the disease is still prevalent in other parts of the world, most notably at the moment in India. In fact, more new cases of COVID have been diagnosed around the world in the last seven days than at any time since this pandemic began. And nobody, nobody wants to go back into lockdown, not ever. And that's why today's announcement, removing the stay in the UK restrictions from the 17th of May, is necessarily cautious. We must make absolutely sure that the countries we reconnect with are safe, that their infection rates are low and that their vaccination rates are high. It means making sure that we're not incubating the most dangerous variants, that they're not, uh, and that they have safe and secure surveillance in place. And that's why the Global Travel Task Force has come up with the traffic light system classifying destinations by risk. And this is based on data by the Joint Biosecurity Centre, and it will be published on gov.uk. Red countries are those which should not be visited except in the most extreme of circumstances where repeated testing and isolation in designated government hotels on return is compulsory. Non-UK residents who have been, been in a red country in the last 10 days will still be barred from entering the UK. I have to tell you now that due to concern about COVID rates and variants of concern, Turkey, the Maldives, Nepal must regrettably be added to the red list today. Amber countries form the biggest group. Uh, as with the red list, you should not be travelling to these places right now. Returnees will have to do tests on three separate occasions, once before departure, twice after arrival, and isolate in a place of their choosing for 10 days. 
Finally, we have the green countries, which you will have the opportunity to visit no earlier than the 17th of May, as long as you take a pre-departure test before returning to England and a second PCR test two days after you return. And with these green countries, you will not need to quarantine. And travellers will be glad to hear that we've been successful in driving down the costs of tests. However, by necessity, uh, this initial green list must be, I'm afraid, limited. So I'm announcing today that from May the 17th, you'll be able to travel to 12 green list countries and territories, which includes Portugal, Gibraltar and Israel. I regret the favourite summer destinations like France and Spain and Greece are not yet included, but every three weeks from reopening, we'll be reviewing the countries uh, to see how and where we can expand the green list. So this is just a first step. The signs overseas are now more promising as a result of their vaccination programmes beginning to crank up. And as the summer progresses, we hope that more traditional tourist destinations will be unlocked. But we have to turn the key slowly. And green list countries will be placed on a watch list if we start to have any concerns. And if it's necessary because of a new upswing in cases or a new variant, we'll not hesitate to act fast and withdraw green status. So it's up to you to check thoroughly before traveling. And if you're thinking of booking a holiday in a green list destination, please check the restrictions applying to new arrivals. You can get this information on GovUK, and it is important because each country has its own restrictions. Indeed, our strong advice is not to book any holiday which does not include a refund in the event that the COVID-related situation changes and you're able to cancel. And I'm afraid we do expect longer delays at airports, and Paul will be saying more about this in just a moment. But all these measures are necessary to protect us from new variants and guard against a resurgence of infections. And that is why the UK has now developed the most comprehensive testing regime on the planet, testing up to two million people per day, mobilizing our world leading genome sequencing sp to spot mutations that could lead to new uh, variants. And these are, if you like, the walls of our fortress, because the first duty of any government is to preserve the safety of its people. But it's also our responsibility to show global leadership, to work with other countries, to create safe standards for international travel. Uh, these were the issues I discussed with the G7 transport secretaries when I chaired a meeting with them earlier this week. And I was able to set out our own traffic light system as part of international leadership, the government's working to develop these standards, global standards for digital travel certification. So from the 17th of May, English residents will be able to use their existing NHS health app to gain access to their vaccine records. Alternatively, they'll be able to request a paper letter to verify their vaccination status. Now, before I finish, uh, let me make one final point. I know that there are many people watching who might want restrictions to be lifted faster and to go further. And there are, if anything, more people who prefer us to go at a slower pace. What, what unites us all, I think, is the belief that we don't want to return to the days of misery and suffering and, and loss. And we must keep our fortress built at such a huge cost to all of us secure. Until brighter days when unrestricted travel will allow us to meet people who mean the most to us. For now, we must tread carefully, respecting the science that will guide us along the way. I'd like now to turn to Jenny to cover the epidemiological situation. Jenny. Thank you, Secretary. Could I have the first slide, please? Uh, so I'm just going to talk through four slides which give the uh, epidemiological picture across the UK at the moment. And what we see here is the number of people testing positive for COVID-19 in the UK. Um, 
Help, uh, thankfully, the new cases have continued to decline uh, right across all four nations. Um, and you can see that from a peak at the start of the year, around 60,000 cases, um, our latest figure is 2,060. And that's actually a decline of just over 300 from uh, this time last week. And, and the case rates per 100,000, which have been up in the hundreds, are now down on average to 23 per 100,000. There is some variation across the country, and there is uh, an element of plateauing here, and our positivity is plateaued at around 0.8%. Next slide, please. Uh, then moving on to hospital data, and uh, what you'll see is that, as we know, the curve shifts a little bit to the right. People tend to uh, be hospitalised slightly later, about two weeks into infection. Um, and uh, again, in the UK, hospital bed occupancy for COVID-19 patients uh, peaked around the middle of January uh, at around 39,000 beds in usage. And since then, it has continued to drop dramatically. So hospital admission rates now overall are just above 1 per 100,000, 1.04 uh, in the last week, um, with again some variation across the country. Uh, all uh, UK nations have seen that decline in hospital beds, um, and uh, we have a, a decrease of 19% in the preceding week. So currently we have uh, 1,231 people uh, in hospital with COVID. But again, just to note that that very rapid decline is plateauing slightly as we go into May. Next slide, please. Um, uh, so here we have uh, the number of deaths of people who had a positive test result for COVID in the UK. Again, if we look back, uh, we have moved from a very sad position in January uh, to where there was well over 1,000 uh, deaths per day associated with COVID. Uh, and we're now down to the most recent seven-day average at just 12 deaths per day. Now, of course, every one of those uh, is uh, important and a significant loss, but this shows a considerable decline um, as we go forward into the summer months. And that means that our daily deaths are now less than 0.1 per 100,000 in each UK nation. Uh, and the final slide, please. And this slide shows the number of people who've received a vaccination for COVID-19 in the UK. So the total number of people cumulatively who've received vaccination by the 6th of May. Um, and we have given uh, 35.1 million uh, individuals their first dose. Uh, and of these, uh, another 16.8 have received a second dose. So the first dose only are the blue bars. And what you can see now is that orange bar uh, shows the number of uh, individuals who have received both doses. And it is really important at this point to highlight that if you have had one dose, do come back for your second dose because this is likely to boost your immunity and keep you safer for longer. So uh, key message there, go and get your jab as the... Uh, Transport Secretary has highlighted this is a really strong part of the armament in the UK and is contributing significantly to those reductions in hospitalisations and case rates. Thank you. Jenny, thanks very much indeed. I'd like to invite uh, Paul Lincoln, Director General of Border Force, to talk about our ports. Thank you very much, Transport Secretary. I'd like to start by paying tribute to the thousands of men and women across Border Force who throughout the pandemic have worked tirelessly to keep the UK safe and secure all whilst facilitating legitimate trade and travel and helping ensure that the UK's transition from the EU was a smooth one. When I last spoke at one of these press conferences, I said we all look forward to a time when travel is fully back up and running and Border Force stands ready to provide a warm welcome to the UK. But unfortunately, we are not back to normality yet. And today I want to take this opportunity to, take, uh, to set out what people can expect to see at the border in terms of the new traffic light system when travel starts to resume on the 17th of May. Travel will be different and as the Transport Secretary says we still need to be cautious. There will continue to be additional health checks for every person crossing our border and inevitably that will mean it will take longer for most people to enter the UK. These measures have been put in place to protect the hard-fought gains and sacrifices that have been made by individuals and societies in the UK, minimising the risks of importing variants whilst protecting the success of our vaccine rollout. But ensuring the biosecurity of this country is a joint effort. As well as Border Force and wider government, every passenger, every carrier, every seaport and every airport has a role to play in this endeavour. 
For the time being, passengers will need to expect an increase in the time taken at each stage of their journey. It currently takes a Border Force officer five to ten minutes to complete all the necessary checks, which means even for the most compliant passenger, it might take 14 or 15 times longer to process them before compared to around 25 seconds. And where people do not have the correct paperwork, it can and has taken considerably longer, including when we need to serve fixed penalty notices for non-compliance. Border Force uh, officers have to date been manually checking that each person has a valid negative COVID-19 test and that has been taken within 72 hours of their journey to the UK. That everyone has also booked a day two and day eight test package. That those travelling from red countries have booked into a quarantine hotel and are handed off to the managed quarantine service. That those arriving from elsewhere understand the requirement to quarantine at home for 10 days. And finally, that people have correctly completed their passenger locator form so that they can be contacted by NHS test and trace if necessary. To keep us all safe, ministers all agree that Border Force should check 100% of passengers, and we have and will continue to do so. But we have been taking several steps to significantly improve and speed up this process. We are digitising a number of the checks just mentioned, including the passenger locator form process so it can be used in e-gates. We are providing a simpler process for carriers at check-in, and we'll be increasing the number of Border Force officers that are available to process passengers at immigration desks. We will do all that we can to smooth the process, and the rollout of the summer of our e-gate upgrade programme will help minimise the time at the border for as many people as possible. But the travel industry also needs to play its part by making sure that every passenger is ready for the checks before they meet the border. Nonetheless, passengers should still expect times at the border to take longer as we conduct the checks that the public rightly expect during this global pandemic. Border Force officers will deliver the best service possible, but they will also continue the vital work that they do every day to protect national security, to prevent drugs, weapons and other illicit goods from entering the UK, to crack down on illegal migration and to protect vulnerable people. We all understand that queues are frustrating to those who are travelling, especially after long journeys and with young families and when people want to return to their loved ones. But if we all play our part in complying with the health checks, collectively we will also all help to ensure the safety of our communities whilst making sure that the gradual increase in international travel is as smooth as possible. Paul, thanks very much indeed. I'd like now to turn to our first question, which comes from David in West Cornwall. Keeping the roadmap timetable depends on the vaccine deployment programme continuing successfully. There doesn't seem to be a shortage in vaccine supply at present, but might that success be threatened by a significant shortfall in vaccine uptake, particularly in the younger age groups? If so, what level of uptake is needed to keep to the timetable? David, thanks very much. I'm going to actually ask uh, Jenny to comment on this, but I will just say uh, the level of uptake has been absolutely phenomenal um, so far. Uh, I, I think it's fair to say far higher than uh, anyone anticipated when we were talking about these things uh, in advance. And it's one of the reasons that the UK has got itself uh, into this much, much uh, better situation. Um, it's important that continues, and I'm going to ask Jenny to comment on uh, the supply and the rest of it. Thank you. Um well, I think the important thing here is, as, as the uh, Transport Secretary said, we have had brilliant uptake uh, in vaccine in this country. And in fact, we are probably the leading country for vaccine confidence. People are, are very confident to come forward, and they should be. And, and you can see that in the data that we have around our case rates, this is making a really strong impact. Um, we have, uh, we're guaranteed to offer uh, a, a first dose of vaccine to every adult by the end of July. There will be some um, uh, assurance as we go through on the vaccine production but uh, we're still on track to do that um, and of course we're just coming into vaccinating the younger age groups the under 40s so I think it would be wrong of us to jump to conclusions that the younger people will not take up the vaccine they have been uh, brilliant in uh, stepping forward to comply for example with students with regulations last autumn 
Um, so I think we should just wait and see. I think we have every confidence that people will step forward uh, and do that, and I think they will be uh, encouraged by the fact that we now have a long record uh, of doing so in this country. It has been absolutely really? tremendous, and long may it continue. I'm going to go to Nicola in uh, Surrey. Nicola says the first uh, two vaccines were approved for use very quickly, but this process seems to have stalled for uh, the other potential vaccines and why. Well, we know that actually a third vaccine, uh, Moderna, was also uh, approved, and I think, in, in use. But again, Jenny, you're probably best. Yes, best. thank you. So, I mean, the remarkable thing actually is that we have three approved vaccines for a new, a new virus within the short time frame that we have, and they have all undergone uh, the appropriate safety checks and the continued reporting, which you will see uh, through uh, MHRA. Uh, I don't think we can say it's stalled at all. Uh, we have good progress through, uh, and it's important, of course, that each step is taken. It's not just uh, the, the government or uh, the scientists that propose these to go through. It's also when uh, trials are finished, uh, and uh, clearly it's important that we take note of those studies. So I think other potential vaccines on their way. It varies slightly across the world, uh, but in fact that offer of the first vaccine to every adult by the end of July um, should still be in place for the vaccines that we have. I think it's worth saying as well, the vaccine task force that went out and spent uh, so much time and energy procuring, I think now, I think the last figure I saw was something like 570 million vaccines, um, has put us in a very good uh, position because it means that we've got a variety of different vaccine candidates that we're able to uh, bring in, including announcements about bill, uh, uh, factories which are producing more here, uh, including in the northeast, but a very much a collective effort, including with the public taking up uh, vaccines in such large numbers. Yeah, and just, just adding to that, of course, one of the other things that is happening uh, is around uh, looking to check that we have vaccines available going forward against variants of, uh, uh, of uh, coronavirus um, and investment uh, in uh, Public Health England's Port and Down Labs there recently to make sure that we can assess the effectiveness of our current vaccines against new variants, which is just as important, I think, as what we have currently. Thank you to Nicola in Surrey. We'll go to Caroline Davis at the BBC next. Thank you, Transport Secretary. Firstly, there are only 12 countries and territories on this list. Many passengers will be very disappointed by that, as will the industry. Why are there so few? And secondly, you've put Turkey on the red list. What does that mean for the UEFA Champions League final that's due to be played there? Thanks very much. I, look, as I explained in my, uh, in my comments, it, we are having to be cautious about this initially. We don't want to overturn all the brilliant work of, uh, you know, frankly, the British people in taking these uh, vaccines and staying at home and all of that pain. And uh, so we can't do anything to put that at risk. Having said that, although there are only 12 countries and territories, it does include, uh, for example, Portugal and, uh, and uh, some of its islands, uh, uh, popular uh, holiday uh, destinations, in, including Israel, who will start to uh, accept uh, people from outside the country. I think it's on the 21st of May. Um, but I do accept that it is a slow but very deliberate uh, rollout of this. Uh, and I noted that um, uh, Heathrow, for example, uh, who you might think would jump on your comments, actually agree that this is the right approach and that this steady, um, slow process initially uh, is the right way to go. It's worth pointing out there are two separate points at which we'll have reviews. First of all, the Joint Biosecurity Centre will review this data every three weeks. And so we will have another review uh, point uh, along uh, uh, pr pretty, pretty soon. Uh, the second thing to say is we've got checkpoints built into this. The checkpoints mean that we're looking at what has to happen in a green amber or red in terms of uh, the requirements for testing and so on and so forth. So this will be a fast developing situation, but really the key thing to say is the reason there aren't more places on the list is there aren't more places that are in the fortunate position that the United Kingdom has got itself in. As Jenny says, people coming forward for vaccines. As I was saying, the vaccine task force and the government um, doing such uh, a strong work a year ago to make sure we were ahead of the world in terms of having those vaccines. So if you're looking for the answer, it is simply that the rest of the world needs a bit of time to catch up with our more fortunate vaccine position before we'll be able to open up travel to those uh, locations. Uh, you ask a very good question about the uh, situation with regard to uh, UEFA and uh, the, the, the situation for uh, Turkey. And as I said in my comments, I'm afraid we are having to put Turkey on the red list. And this will have a number of ramifications. And first of all, uh, it does mean, I'm afraid, with regard to the Champions League, that um, fans should not 
travel to Turkey. Um, the FA, I can tell you, are in discussions with UEFA uh, already on this. Uh, we are very open to hosting uh, the, 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 the final, but it is ultimately a decision for uh, UEFA. Uh, of course, it's worth mentioning the UK has already got a successful track record uh, of uh, football matches with spectators, so we're <laughs> well placed um, to do it. And I have spoken to the Secretary of State for Cultural Media and Sport uh, this afternoon uh, about this. So we're very open to it. It is actually, in the end, a, a decision for UEFA uh, to make. But given that there are two English clubs uh, in that final, uh, we look forward to hearing what they have to say. Thank you very much indeed. I'll turn now to Tom Clark at ITV. Thank you, Secretary of State. Um, well, we worry about where we might be able to travel to. The virus is uh, proving it's pretty capable of travelling into the UK. How concerned are you and should we be about the doubling of the number of um, variants of concern originating in India uh, here in the UK? And um, how concerned should we be about the Indian variants compared to those from South Africa and Brazil, for example? So, uh, there are two places to answer this. One is, of course, with the excellent border protection that Paul Lincoln and his, his team are providing, which is helping us to keep on top of variants of concern. Uh, the si second thing is now that the, uh, the, the variant in India is a variant of concern rather than a variant of interest, which it has been up till uh, recently. I'm going to ask Jenny to comment on the epidemiological yep. situation. Thank you. Um, so I think, yes, we should be concerned, and I'll come to the action that we're taking. Um, but there is quite a complicated message here, I think. Uh, so it's a good sign. We've seen the slides there, and our overall positivity rates have dropped dramatically. Um, but in some areas, there are some variants of concern, particularly the Indian one, which have uh, risen quite sharply in the last week or two. So those areas, uh, we really do want people to be extra cautious. Again, it's important just because that particular one, the, so the, uh, the B16172, uh, the, the, uh, one of the three variants that we're seeing from India, has increased quite rapidly. The other two, the one under the three number, are still variants under interest. Um, and when we move them to a variant of concern, it's because we find something uh, in how they're behaving or uh, some of uh, the um, mutation that we think might give some cause for concern, either a particular vaccine escape, severity of disease or transmissibility. Now, what we have with this particular Indian variant at the moment is that we found yesterday at the uh, technical group, the variant technical group, uh, that the transmissibility was at least equal to uh, the Ke what we've been calling the Kemp variant. It's the B117. It's actually very widespread, but people will uh, recognise it by that name. Um, and we don't yet know many other characteristics about it. It takes quite a while to understand, uh, for example, uh, the severity of disease or, or um, what it means for um, vaccine effectiveness. So while we're watching that, actually, we are taking a whole host of steps to ensure that in areas where we have seen that, uh, we have enhanced contact tracing, uh, we're going in uh, with um, messaging, working with local communities, with local directors of public health um, to ensure that people are really aware um, of the potential risk. We're encouraging people to continue to work from home, all the things we know, uh, socialise outdoors, even if uh, the situation and the rules change. It's really important people continue to do that. And this is likely to be a bit of a pattern as we go forward. So we need the public to do everything that they have been doing uh, in uh, sticking to the rules, but in those particular areas to be being uh, particularly careful. And we will continue to monitor it. I, I think one of the important things is uh, the UK has absolutely brilliant genomics. We contribute about a third of the total global uh, genomic sequences uh, that are um, uh, put up on uh, Gazade. Um, and uh, so we have a very, very clear picture of what we have in terms of variants of concern and under investigation. And of course, the, the reason why we're taking uh, variants of concern um, so seriously is one of the reasons in, in response to the previous BBC question that we're not opening up too fast because we want to be in a position to control it. And it's a, one of the reasons why uh, Paul Lincoln and his team are checking 100% of people at borders, although that will uh, increasingly on the green list countries um, start to become a digital uh, check through the e-gate and the passenger locator form uh, over time. Can we go to Paul Kelso of uh, Sky? Mm. 
We can see you there, Paul. I don't know if you can hear us or not. I can now. Can you hear me now? We're loud and clear. We know that the travel industry is desperate to get restarted. Gatwick, where I am, is deserted. But we've seen already prices starting to soar as a result of speculation around this list. And we know travel companies are declining to offer refunds, even for people with pre-existing uh, reservations to countries on your orange list. Does this system not simply making travel the preserve of the rich? And if I may, with respect, a fortnight in the Falklands isn't most people's idea of a summer holiday. Is it realistic to think that this year we will see the return of mass travel to Spain, to France, and other really popular destinations as opposed to this tiny list of many islands? Thanks very much. Um, look, Paul, the first thing is that it's very important that people do check the terms and conditions of booking very, very carefully. You mentioned uh, travel uh, companies and what, what people would have called travel agents but perhaps in the past. It is the case that if you're booking a uh, package, for example, I've extended the ability of people to get uh, not just uh, refunds but also travel vouchers, which will be guaranteed through the scheme that people know of uh, as Atoll. Uh, so that a voucher can be uh, given. It perhaps creates a little bit less stress on the travel company through for those uh, refunds, the package holiday, but at the same time provides the reassurance for uh, consumers, whereas previously uh, the, providing cash back was the only uh, option. So the government's tried to back the industry in, in, in that sense. But it is possible for people to book direct. We do know that sometimes uh, that, 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 uh, that may lead to problems. And uh, certainly I've had a lot, plenty of people in the last year contact me in, in that position. So please check very, very carefully when it comes to terms and conditions. And I, I note now that a lot of the travel companies and a lot of the airlines have put some very smart packages in place, enabling people to change, for example, the time of their flight, the date of their flight, without uh, cost for doing so, but check. Secondly, uh, does it become the reserve of the rich? And do you want a holiday in, in, the, in the Falklands? Uh, there are other locations uh, on there, uh, although I'm sure the Falklands is, is, is lovely. Um, but uh, look, this is not a list generated and created um, to, if, if you like, um, uh, think about where people want to lie on beaches and then twist the science uh, to fit it. That would be completely wrong. It would go against everything that we have said about uh, in fact, it would betray the, the sort of um, what everyone has gone through for the last year, the sacrifices that people have made, staying home, going to get the vaccine when called, the enormous national uh, effort. If we were then to throw it all away and just say, well, we'll add some holiday destinations on. We cannot do that. And I hope people will. I think people will uh, appreciate and understand that. What we can and will do, though, is review the list very regularly. And uh, Jenny will correct me if I'm wrong, but... Uh, you mentioned 12 uh, 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 fatalities, deaths per day on a seven-day running average. When I came in, I checked where France is at. I think it's about 220 fatalities uh, per day. We just need to give other places in the world a chance to catch up, and some of those places are the locations where people will want to go on holiday. So to answer your last question about whether we'll see mass travel uh, or not, uh, look, I think we will gradually see an opening up. We see that the, uh, that the, um, the, the vaccines are extremely effective. But what we can't do and what we don't know is the extent to which uh, somebody who is vaccinated might still be capable of carrying uh, a variant of concern back with them and we cannot put the British people at risk in that way. So it's a gentle, gradual thing. As I mentioned before, Heathrow uh, and others uh, are welcoming uh, the steps today. It is a first step, but it's a very deliberate one with some clear review points in there as well. Uh, Jenny, I don't know if there's anything. I think you've you've uh, mentioned all, all the important things. It, it is just really important, as you said earlier, that we progress with necessary caution. Um, uh, and we, you can see, I mean, I think uh, the public will have realised just from looking at the picture in India, just how quickly a uh, virus can take off, particularly if there is uh, low vaccine coverage uh, in those countries or you have uh, um, a, a large number of people without uh, spacing and all of the things that we've got used to doing. So obviously that varies significantly across the world, but there is a regular review point. The Joint Biosecurity Centre has a very detailed exploration of all of the different uh, criteria, so uh, whether it be testing capacity, whether it be the capability of a country to look at the genome sequencing. 
whole host of things that we didn't have last year. So I think a lot of reassurance that all of this is looking at, looked at in great detail. And as countries are able to move into those different traffic light areas, uh, then ministers will be able to make those decisions. I think it's worth actually um, saying, as Jenny uh, hinted at, um, the Joint Biosecurity Centre last year would use pretty blunt information, really. It was about the number of cases per 100,000 uh, over a seven-day uh, period. Uh, this year, it's about not just the prevalence of cases, it's about the variance of concern. It's about the ability of the country to uh, test the quality of their data, how good their genome sequencing uh, is. And uh, I think reassuringly, uh, Paul, all of that's going to be published uh, this year, both the methodology and the data, so people can see themselves how and why the particular countries and territories that are being included at the moment are in there, and uh, I think that will be helpful for everyone. Thanks very much, Paul. Can we go to Lucy Fisher of The Telegraph? Thank you. Two quick questions, if I may. Firstly, for Mr Lincoln. Will Border Force deploy more staff to ease delays at the border, and if so, how many? And secondly, a question for the Transport Secretary, please. Vaccinated Britons are allowed to travel to other countries without having to take expensive COVID tests or quarantine, but the UK government insists on these measures from vaccinated travellers. Why doesn't the government have faith in the vaccine and will this policy be reviewed? Thanks very much, uh, Lucy. Paul. Yes, thank you, Lucy. I mean, um, we will, and I said in my opening statement that we will be increasing the number of Border Force officers who will be uh, available to process passengers at immigration desks. I mean, I should put this in the context that um, there are currently, at the moment, more um, Border Force officers processing passengers at Heathrow uh, than any other time since 2012 Olympics. And the reason why uh, people talk about this is because we have had to deal with a lot of non-compliant passengers, and that sometimes takes uh, Border Force officers away. So what I'm very pleased to have announced today is the simplification of the processes we've put in place, which should make it easier for passengers, should make it easier for carriers, it should make it easier for our officers, and do our best to speed people through the border. Thanks very much. Um, in answer to your second point about vaccinated Brits being allowed to travel to other countries, actually, when I look around the world, and as I mentioned in my comments, I chaired a meeting of the uh, G7, the Group of Seven uh, Secretaries of State for Transport uh, in the week, uh, and actually, um, th they don't have systems in place for uh, travel yet. They haven't launched their equivalents of the Global Travel Task Force, nor do they have traffic light systems. Actually, by and large, we, because we have managed to vaccinate a higher proportion of the population faster than other countries, we're also ahead in terms of this unlock program, both the wider roadmap of which the 17th of May and the 21st of uh, June are the third and fourth uh, moments, but also in terms of uh, unlocking uh, travel. But you ask a really interesting question about, well, if you've been double vaccinated, you know, why shouldn't you be able to uh, go uh, travel? And it's a question, of course, we're asking all the time. And again, actually, I'm going to to lean on uh, advice here from uh, Jenny, because I think it's one of the things, uh, the questions that scientists are having to tackle most at the, at the moment. So, uh, thank you. So, I think from uh, what, what I've said previously, uh, we are learning a lot about the vaccines. So, we're very confident that for most uh, variants out there at the moment, uh, the vaccines that we're using will prevent, uh, protect the individual from serious disease uh, and from hospitalisation. Uh, we think also that there is a degree of effectiveness in vaccine transmission, and there was some media on that, I think, at the beginning of last week. However, there are two particular points. One is that is not a complete uh, picture. So some people, we all, all vaccine programmes actually, uh, that will not work for every single individual. So uh, we encourage as many people as possible to reduce the the chance of, uh, uh, of disease uh, being around. Uh, but we don't yet have absolute clarity, I think, on the transmission risk. And that continues to be the case as new variants arise. So we know, as I've said previously, there are thousands of variants. Um, and we, every now and again, they're not all of significance. Many will appear and die down again and be of no concern at all. Uh, but the South African variant, of course, we've done, uh, that has risen a little bit in the UK, but has been reasonably contained, uh, each of these actually suggests that there is a little lowering of the effect of the vaccine in that case, and each new variant we're looking to make sure 
that vaccines continue to be effective. So uh, as a new variant arises, if you're going over to another country, particularly if they have lower uh, genomic sequencing capabilities, they're very unlikely to know what they have in their population and individuals will potentially bring it back to this one. And one of the important points I would just like to make is when travellers are coming back, it is absolutely critical that they have their early test, their PCR test. So they have one before uh, they leave the other country. They must, if they're positive, they must comply with local isolation regulations. But when they come back into this country, they must have a PCR test uh, up to uh, day two. So in that very early phase, what that does is firstly, uh, we know whether they are sick and whether they need to isolate. But actually they are contributing not just to the UK knowledge about the growth of variants from different countries, but to uh, the global knowledge about it. So we can sequence where others can't. We contribute that information to global knowledge um, and then the whole world learns to protect themselves better. So really important to have that test. Thanks very much, Jenny. And, and Lucy, I just say we've come so far, we just don't want to mess this up. Uh, now, I think, would be the shorthand for all of that. And the scientists are, are working hard on um, getting the hard data to uh, back it up. Thank you very much. If I can go to Torkel uh, Crichton from the Daily Record, please. Uh, thank you, Minister. Uh, can you provide some clarity? You talk about travellers from England and your press release talks about England. You don't have four nations agreement for this by the by the sounds of it. And, and if you don't, it's a bit of a farce, isn't it? If, if I have a reader in Fife who wants to go to Faro and they're not allowed to travel from a Scottish airport, they just jump on a train to, to Heathrow and they, they, they jump a red light. It, it undermines the, the, the UK four nation approach, isn't it? So, first of all, I should let you know that I've, uh, I held a call with the devolved administrations um, earlier today and uh, all of the four uh, chief medical officers of the Joint uh, Biosecurity Centre have met and agreed the principles that sit behind the traffic light um, system. So there is a, a large degree of uh, agreement and uh, cooperation in developing the system. Uh, I think more to your point, there happen to be elections uh, on or rather election counts uh, in uh, Wales and um, Scotland uh, at the moment. And so understandably, whilst those governments are uh, in, uh, in, in flux uh, uh, and there aren't effective opposite numbers to, to speak to, it may take a few days for uh, them to uh, prescribe precisely uh, what they wish to do. But it is with their uh, agreement that the, if you like, the traffic light system itself has been uh, created. Uh, and as we saw uh, last year, I suspect that by and large we'll see the same conclusions for the simple reason uh, that the, the science is the science. The epidemiological situation is that that presents, us, uh, presents to us all. And since we're working from the same traffic light system, it stands to reason it will be uh, broadly uh, similar uh, in design. Um, so that is the, that's the, the picture. We look forward to there being governments in place uh, in both uh, Wales uh, and Scotland. Uh, and uh, uh, to having a, as joined up a picture as possible. Just on your final point, though, I would say what you sort of pointed out is it's possible for people to break the law. And of course, it's possible for people to break the law in all sorts of uh, different uh, ways, but people should respect uh, the law as it is legislated uh, in our uh, devolved uh, system of government throughout the uh, four nations. And so we must never encourage anybody to, as you describe it, break the law, jump on a train and do something uh, which they should not be doing and presumably would carry... Um, some pretty big fines uh, if they were to do so. Thanks very much. I'll turn now to Jim Scott at the Northern Echo. Jim. Thank you. As the country exits the national lockdown and as more restrictions are eased, there will inevitably be an increase in cases. But if there is a spike in COVID infections in one particular region, such as the northeast, is the government likely to consider preventing residents in that area from travelling abroad? We've come out, as we come out of this lockdown, we've got this four-stage uh, roadmap. And um, as, you, as you know and will have noted, uh, we haven't gone back into a tiered um, situation. That's possible, actually, because overall our levels are so much lower. And where they're low overall, uh, where the prevalence is, is low, uh, you're able to take a much more national uh, approach to all of this. Uh, and I very much um, hope, Jim, and I'm going to ask um, Jenny to comment, uh, but we're not going back uh, to those bad old days of very high levels of, of uh, uh, enormous prevalence uh, and the rest of it, because we've got the one thing that we didn't have when we got down to these very low uh, levels uh, last time round, and that is, of course, the vaccine. Actually, I said the one, there's a second thing, which is mass testing. Every adult in this country, every secondary child in this country can have two tests a week, free, delivered to their 
homes and millions of people are taking up that offer and it's helping to us to, us to identify where there are, are problems. So we are much better positioned this year with vaccines, with testing, with genomic sequencing uh, to not need to take that localised uh, approach. And so far, um, so good, but I'm going to hand over to an expert here. No, it's, it's a really important question, but I think the ambition is exactly as the Transport Secretary has said, um, that we know that there have been certain areas which I think we now would frame as where there has been enduring transmission, and it's those populations who have really had to be locked down for very lengthy periods of time, and that's not just unhelpful for them and, and a bit miserable uh, for them uh, during that time, but actually it will affect the health of those populations in the longer term as well if they've had higher rates of, of COVID, potentially uh, long COVID implications and uh, in, implications for uh, uh, the viability and the, and the health of their families long term, so missed school and all sorts of things. So I think our approach at the moment is to actually really focus on those areas of enduring transmission in a number of ways, working with directors of public health and local authorities. There are a number of different community testing programmes so that where we see those higher rates, to go in to help support individuals to find uh, infections uh, and to uh, help them to isolate. Many of these families are ones with perhaps where they're more likely to have to go out to work um, or they're in large families, it's less easy to isolate. And there are a number of ways uh, the which local authorities can, can uh, support them uh, with central government funding through a communities uh, fund to do that. But it's a really good point and it is actually our focus of attention as we come out of the lockdowns um, and really focus uh, as we go forward. And once again, just encourage if, if individuals are in areas where there are variants of concern, really to be extra careful in those until those rates have subsided. Jenny, thanks very much indeed. I just want to end by saying, uh, you know, I could never have imagined when I became Secretary of State for Transport that I would be responsible for locking down all international travel, indeed, most of the domestic travel network as well. And I'm pleased that we're finally in the position of opening up. I've been looking forward to today or a day like today for a very long time. But we do have to follow a very cautious approach. We've got to follow the science at every step. We don't want to throw away the very hard one uh, gains. But I think as confidence builds, as the rest of the world is able to catch up with our uh, successful vaccination program and get themselves vaccinated, I expect that we will see a situation where more countries will open up. But please check the details carefully, look on gov.uk and make sure that you have refundable uh, options and most of all, of course, remain safe. Thank you very much. Thank you.